Okay, so why don't we move on to impingement of the shoulder. So uh, we'll talk about impingement and then talk about the pathophysiology of injuries to the tendon. And then we'll talk about tendon changes. And then we'll go into uh, talk about rotator, uh, you know, what to do, what to do about it in surgery and so forth. So there are a number of impingement syndromes that have been described around the shoulder. Uh, a chromial and a chromioclavicular joint uh, were described a number of years ago, predominantly by Charles Neer uh, in New York at that particular time. Uh, then there's also anterior or primary core cord impingement and internal impingement that we'll talk about in overhead throwing athletes. So near impingement, really this is a classic article in 1983. At this particular time, he believed that a major cause of rotator cuff tears was bony pressing upon the supraspinatus tendon uh, in the outlet, uh, causing injury to the tendon, secondary breakdown of the tissues, and then a tear. Uh, you know, part of that is now believed, but not all of it. Uh, it's as we'll talk about it going through uh, through the the data now really support that actual bony impingement is not a common cause of rotator cuff injury. Uh, so impingement is not considered nearly as important as it was before, uh, and the kind of surgery for shoulder pain has really uh, moved away from. Uh, the near impingement where you did a chromioplasties and uh, uh, to to other uh, forms. And it is now primarily believed that rotator cuff tears are due to primary degenerative disease and breakdown of the, of the collagen molecules within the tendon uh, due to re recurrent traction injury and not due to actual bony impingement. So anyway, going but let's go through this because this is still an a important concept. And like a lot of important concepts, they kind of come and go and it may come back again. But basically, Nier described three stages of impingement, uh, where the first stage was you get edema and hemorrhage in the tendon that goes on to fibrosis and tendonitis, basically chronic degenerative disease of the tendon. And then you can develop a lot of bone spurs and, and complete tendon rupture. So of this kind of impingement, you can have anterior acromial impingement that can be due to an abnormal congenital shape of the acromial or acquired, called a type 3. Uh, you can have anterior slope of the acromion where it slopes down in front, uh, lateral downsloping of the acromion, inferior placement of the acromion with respect to the distal clavicle, and then uh, uh, you, another cause of symptoms in this location that we'll talk about is the is when the muscular tendinous junction of the supraspinatus tendon is located more distally than it should, in which case the muscle itself extends into the outlet, which is not large enough for it, and it can produce impingement upon the muscle and uh, ischemia within the muscle, which can produce pain. That's uh, not very common. And then you can also get impingement at the acromioclavicular joint, <clears throat> generally due to osteophytes or fibrous callus, from degenerative disease of the acromioclavicular joint. So uh, the types of acromion was initially uh, described uh, by one of uh, Charlie Neer's fellows, uh, whose name I'm blanking on right now, but I'll, he'll come to me in a minute, is primarily using the outlet view on x-rays, <clears throat> but we can see something similar, but it's not exactly the same on MR, where type 1 acromion in the oblique sagittal plane is flat, like we see here. A type 2 shows a gentle curve, and this is the most common kind. And a type 3 is where you have a hook on the anterior aspect of the acromion, which abruptly narrows the space between the acromion and humeral head. And this is thought to produce a bony mechanical irritation of the tendon in this location, which can lead to anterior tears within the supraspinatus tendon. And that's no longer considered a common cause of tendon disease, as I said. Or you can have acquired osteophytes. Here's the osteophyte that acquires in this location, in large part due to traction injuries from the coracochromial ligament 
in this location that can narrow the anterior space and potentially induce trauma to the anterior supraspinatus tendon. There's another uh, osteophyte growing along the corcochromial ligament, uh, which uh, can produce a type 3 uh, anatomy to the acromion process. Uh, you can also see inferior osteophytes. Here, this is a, a acromion. That it, there's no lateral downsloping, but you can have a cr an irregularity. This indicates that you have some sort of trauma between the supraspinatus and the acromion process producing this hypertrophic bone formation in this location, but it's not been really clearly in recent studies associated with actual tears of the rotator cuff. But here we can see a lot of tendinopathy of the supraspinatus tendon, kind of in the area where that uh, where they could impinge upon the uh, acromion process. And the concept here is if you have a nice smooth acromion, uh, it would be like taking the, the teeth off of a saw. If you try to saw into a board with no teeth, you're not going to get through that board very well. But if you put uh, teeth on the saw, just like if you have osteophytes on the undersurface of the acromion, then it can saw through that log or acromion or, or supraspinatus tendon much more effectively. Okay, and then here we can see that there is a, a little bit of downslipping of the acromion. You can see a little bit of thickening here and a lot of tendinosis within the acromion, which is primarily along the superior surface, as we see here. And also the other thing you can get uh, with uh, acromial impingement is irritation of the synovial lining of the subacromial subdeltoid bursa along the superior surface of the supraspinatus tendon, which can cause a bursitis as we see here. And here we can see the irregularity of the superior surface of the supraspinatus tendon and the bursal fluid collection with synovial thickening uh, along with the bursitis. And another example, the cuff is intact. There's no full thickness tear. There's some irregularity of the superior surface, a lot of irregularity of that inferior chromium and this large fusion uh, consistent with subacromial subdeltoid bursitis. And then here we can see a lot of synovial thickening and irregularity in here, which also goes along with subacromial bursitis. And this is just an arthrogram that shows that there's no fluid extending into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa on the T1 fat set, but on the PD fat set, we can see all this fluid and synovial thickening, which goes along with a subacromial bursitis. Let's see. Ilior, what do you think of this case? Okay, so scapular trauma a year ago. Um, yeah, looking at the acromion, maybe there's some undersurface irregularity. Uh, the, yeah, the supraspinatus tendon uh, looks thick and there's, yeah, maybe a defect there. A high grade partial tear. Mm hmm. Although we don't see a lot of fluid in the joint space. Um, yeah, here we see some bursal fluid, subdeltoid bursal fluid. And probably some synovial stranding here as well. Mm -hmm. And there you can see it. This is probably all synovial thickening up through here and fluid here and to and posteriorly. Mm -hmm. And this was subacromial bursitis. And here's a case that would kind of fit with uh, Nier's initial hypothesis, where you have this inferior chromial osteophyte and a brosocyte partial tear of the supraspinatus tendon. Uh, and maybe this tear was associated with the impingement. Uh, but most studies have shown that that association, as I said, is, is not common. So here we go. Robert, does subacromial bony anatomy correlate with risk for cuff tears? Sounds like a trick question, but I, I want to say no. Yeah, uh, they have no uh, statistical association, uh, at least not in symptomatic women, which is what this study was for. Okay. Now, the other thing that you can look for is lateral downsloping. Here we can see a nice horizontally 
uh, position, the uh, chromium process. Here we have mild lateral downsloping, but notice the cortical margins are nice and smooth, uniform in thickness. We don't see any abnormal signal intensity within the supraspinatus tendon. So this may be mild lateral downsloping, but not really significant. Here is a mild lateral downsloping, but here we can see that irregularity of the inferior surface, which goes along with ebernation and inferior osteophytes. In this particular case, we have a little partial bursal side tear also uh, in this particular patient. And then you can get more severe lateral downsloping like we see here, which would be more of a, uh, can be seen on the AP view of the plane films, which was thought to cause increased risk for chromial impingement. In this particular case, we can see that there's a lot of ebernation to the inferior surface of the acromion, probably of broad-based osteophyte here uh, coming off the inferior acromial surface. So this would make us be a little bit more concerned about outlet impingement. But you can see the supraspinatus tendon is intact here. But again, what we see is fluid within the subacromial bursa, maybe a little bit of irregularity to the surface. And this is that broad-based osteophyte, and it's a patient who had an inferior osteophyte and subacromial subdeltoid bursitis. Okay. All right. So, looks like it's the, are we looking at the acromial clavicular joint? Which where is the chromium clavicular joint? At, at the um, anterior. Okay, here's the chromium clavicular joint. What's this? That is. Is it the? Is it supposed to be the corpus or something? Yeah. This is the osochromiale, which uh, is. Uh, a variant that's that's really quite common, uh, where uh, the, the there's a, a growth plate that does not fuse here uh, in the uh, acromion process, and uh, this can the distal tip can become unstable, or you can get uh, motion at the uh, syndesmosis here, which can lead to marginal osteophytes, and sometimes a very prominent degenerative disease, and those osteophytes can lead to impingement as well. And when you get degenerative disease here, it's frequently associated with degenerative disease at the acromic clavicular joint. And that's uh, where you have a lack of proper fusion of the growth plate or the physis here. Here we can see in an older teenage uh, person uh, the normal growth plate here in this particular location. And if it doesn't fuse properly, uh, either due to trauma and uh, late adolescence, or just uh, just congenital, uh, you, you end up with uh, an ossicle here called osochromiale, and uh, that's uh, that can be a uh, cause of impingement. Uh, remember that this physis may not fuse until age of twenty-five. So just uh, if you see a a growth plate there, or, or, or uh, in later teens, uh, not to really worry about it. These have been divided into different types of uh, uh, osochromiale, depending on how large the, the ossicle is. Uh, some people like to include this type of terminology in the reports. I, I generally don't. I generally just uh, describe the osochromiale and, uh, and uh, the degree of degenerative disease at the syndesmosis in the reports. That's in men, isn't it, John? I think it'd be in men or women, can't it, John? Pardon? It can be either men or women, can't it? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. You know, I haven't really noticed if it's only in men. I've always assumed that it's in can be in both men and women. Uh, I've thought it more commonly in men because I think part of the cause of this may well be trauma in the teenage years, which is more common in men because of athletic activity. Uh, but that probably won't persist in uh, in today's world if that's the case. Uh, what I was talking about is uh, 
the fusion of the that's that's the last bone to fuse um, oh, and right. uh, women fuse earlier than men oh i i see what you're saying so yeah it may not fuse until age 25 uh and generally in men right and women it's it's usually fused by age 20. right that's that's what i was talking about Sorry. it's quite a the, 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 the big difference good in the brain too yep <laughs> And then uh, another uh, potential cause of impingement here, which hasn't really been proven to be a, a major cause of symptoms, is inferior placement of the acromion with respect to the distal clavicle. Uh, this can either be post-traumatic or congenital. Uh, and this, you can see, uh, pr produces a, basically a mass between the distal clavicle and the, and the humeral head. Uh, and as it was at one time thought to also be a uncommon cause of, of outlet impingement. Uh, it can also be associated with degenerative changes, and here we can see a little edema in that distal clavicle, probably because of the stresses uh, due to uh, this anomaly. Okay. Taysen, what do you think of this case? All right, so it looks like the acromion has some undersurface irregularity, maybe a mildly thickened the follicle acromion ligament. Okay, right there. And we can see there's a little bit of increased signal intensity here. Yeah. The, 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 this patient, I think, was a professional wrestler. And his main problem, his main complaint was, is that he couldn't carry his luggage. Uh, <clears throat> so he had to actually had to have someone help carry his luggage, even though his luggage wasn't all that heavy. Uh, you know, he could bench press 300 pounds, but he couldn't carry his luggage. So why do you think he had symptoms like that? Um, I guess when he picked it up, it narrowed the subacromial space. Yeah, and the, the, the issue here is is notice normally the musculotendinous junction is right around the twelve o'clock position. Yeah, right. And here the mus this is a, this is actually a demodus muscle here. The musculotendinous junction goes way out to here. Okay. So so this is a congenital anomaly where the muscle extends much more distally than it normally does. There's not really enough space here. So whenever he would have his arms at his shoulder and try to carry his luggage, uh, they would put pressure on the muscle here. He'd get ischemia and, and shoulder pain. Okay. Uh, the, the, this we can see, this kind of pathology, we can see all over the body. Uh, we can see it in the wrist from time to time where you can actually see muscles going all the way into the one of the six or more of the six extensor compartments of the wrist and is an unusual cause of chronic wrist pain uh, because of the same phenomena. And, but, so you can see it in a number of different joints. So that's a distal musculotendinous junction of the supraspinatus tendon. Oh, I'm sorry, this was the, I think this, this was the, the wrestler. And you can see the muscle goes all, the musculotendinous junction is way over here, not at the 12 o'clock position. Okay. I, um, we had one case, uh, with bilateral um, overuse, uh, and this was a weightlifter. Yeah. And uh, the surgery for this was uh, kind of invented by us. We, we, we just go, went and trans, uh, cut it transversely so that that guy could bring his arms up. He couldn't yeah. put his arms down. Wow. His, his arms were up about 45 to, to, to 70 degrees, and that's how he walked around with his arms elevated. Oh, my gosh. Uh, it's an unusual case. Yeah. I don't remember how it did, but it was my partner's case, so he oh, never came back to me. So the kind of the treatment for this, if it's a type three acromium, is an acromioplasty, where you go in and you remove 
that the osteophyte or a congenital abnormal shape of the bone anteriorly here to relieve, to relieve the pressure on the supraspinatus tendon. With that, you'll typically uh, interrupt the corticochromial ligament attachment and that uh, uh, anteriorly. Uh, so what you look for is kind of reshaping of the anterior chromium. Uh, very often, uh, they'll take a little bit of the anterior chromium to, to try to make sure that you decompress this particular area. Here's an example, an MR examination before and after. Now, in this particular case, this is basically a normal anatomy with a normal corticochromial ligament insertion here, uh, but they did an acromioplasty uh, anyway. Generally, this is a much less common procedure than in the past, and uh, uh, I, I think without seeing a definitive abnormality of the anatomy on MR, uh, along with the uh, clinical symptoms, that acromioplasty is probably not indicated. But here you can see they did the acromasty. And in this particular case, the corticochromial ligament uh, maintained its attachment. Here's a, now here's, well, let's see. Uh, Elior, what do you think of this patient? He had uh, shoulder pain, uh, had surgery, but then had uh, persistent pain after surgery. Right. Okay. So it looks like he had an acromioplasty. Um, but yeah, it looks like there's a continued kind of hooked appearance of that lateral acromion with some under. Yeah. yeah. So the, the acromioplasty, if you believe Nier's theory, the impingement occurs in the anterior margin of the acromion process. And here they actually did an chromioplasty posteriorly, but anteriorly where you have this sub, uh, the inferior osteophyte, they didn't actually remove the offending bone. So this is probably an incomplete acromioplasty. Uh, no, that, that was done by a podiatrist? <laughs> I don't think so. Why? Why did you ask that? I don't think it's a podiatrist. But... You know, I, in this day and age, you never can tell. All right, so we have a coronal of the shoulder, and it looks like there's probably been a, a chromioplasty, some degenerative changes kind of of the AC joint there. All right. And uh, the, the, this was someone who had an acromioplasty. It's larger than you'd like. The, the idea behind a chromioplasty should be to convert a, a abnormal type 3, which is normally due to abnormal osteophytes, to a normal anatomy. You don't want to overcorrect it or you become you get superior instability, which is a not uncommon problem with that surgery. Uh, but you also have to realize you can get impingement from osteophytes at the acromioclavicular joint, so you need to make sure those are removed at the same time. And this patient continued to be symptom symptomatic, possibly due to this persistent osteophyte that wasn't removed at the distal clavicle. Yeah, we have to remember that the, the, these procedures were done before arthroscopy, so uh, it's a little different. Yeah. Uh, when you're doing surgery on these, uh, you don't always see that far medially um, because of the capsule but uh, and synovial membrane. But, um, I, I've removed some of these uh, before arthroscopy. Yeah. Okay, Greg? You, you can feel it by, by putting your finger in there and just it, 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 it uh, sharp. 45 year old male with posterior shoulder pain and four year old acromioplasty. Um, looks like there's a large anterior. Osteophyte looks like it's got down sloping. Uh, looks like it's probably causing some impingement on the is it the, is it the supraspinatus there. Looks like there's some increased signal kind of throughout the tendon there. Right. Okay. okay, and then there's one of our cases here. This is uh, kind of a type 3 acromion. This is before and this is after the acromioplasty. Okay. 
Now, the, the other thing that you can see is disease due to hypertrophy at the AC joint. And you can have osteophytes like we saw a minute ago, but you can also get a uh, large callus formation. And this was an, an older female who had shoulder pain, making it difficult for her to carry groceries. And here you can see this fibrous callus at the AC joint. And you can see where she raises her arm that rubs against the supraspinatus tendon out to this point where you see tendinosis. And then the distal supraspinatus tendon is more normal. So you can also get callus at the AC joint. Taysom. All right. Um, so it looks like there's a lot of synovial cysts uh, superior to the AC joint. Yeah, and you can see there's a big rotator cuff tear, superior migration of the humeral head, remodeling of the acromion process. Uh, but this is called the geyser sign. And this, these are large cysts that can develop from the AC joint due to degenerative disease. Okay, good. Okay, AC joint. The question... Two or not to yeah, fat size. Fat size. So, okay. so here we see an arthrogram with uh, PD fat sat and T1 fat sat images. And then if we look at the non fat sat T2, you can actually see the anatomy of the soft tissues a lot better mm -hmm. because fat is really a really good contrast agent in, in the musculoskeletal the system and it helps us delineate the anatomy very well. So, the, the non fat suppressed images. Are actually pretty helpful, but if you've, you've heard me say that over and over again. All right, so we have a plain film and corona MR. It looks like there's uh, some degenerative changes of the AC joint with a large osteophyte inferiorly there. Yeah, so here's the here's the X-ray. Here's the MR scan. You can see where this is pressing down, and notice that the uh, distal muscle, uh, the muscle goes down and then back up again here. So this is clearly pressing on the musculotendinous junction of the supraspinatus. Uh, this person was very symptomatic. He was a big handball player. Actually, it was my first father-in-law. Uh, so yeah, he really had all the classic symptoms. Here's what the MR scan looked like. This is in the early days of MR of the shoulder, and you can see where it's pressing down on the superior surface of the muscle and kind of compressing that musculotendinous junction right there. Now, the treatment for this is called a Mumford procedure, and you'll see a lot of these. Uh, here, the, you basically resect the distal one centimeter of the clavicle and remove the osteophytes. And this was what his shoulder looked like after he had the Mumford procedure. So you can yeah, do, you do put an angle to it a little bit. Uh, like you see here, so the inferior is a little shorter than the. Right, good. And this is a Mumford procedure. Uh, and so uh, the, uh, uh, the cor coracoclavicular ligaments, you don't want to touch those. Yeah, so they'll attach over yeah, here. Yeah, you mess with those, uh, you've got problems. Yeah. Uh, so you'll still see a fair number of bumper procedures, because even if you don't believe in the concept of impingement, uh, there are uh, still a number of people who are symptomatic with degenerative disease of the acromioclavicular joint, and a bumper procedure is still a pretty effective way to treat the pain. Uh, no question about it. So we have a coronal view. Uh, there's the humeral head is very irregular. Um, is there some downsloping of the acromion too, causing some? Uh, not amount, but this. Uh, it's like a trauma. Then there are other for, there are other forms of impingement, and this is a, a previous fracture that didn't heal properly, and so you can get bony deformity from trauma. And clearly, you can see that there is a fracture of the 
lateral aspect of the humeral head, which which healed in the abnormal position, producing a kind of impingement. It, it, it wasn't treated, I don't think, John. Right, that's right. Okay, and then there's a, the next impingement is anterior or crocord impingement, and that's where you have a prominent uh, tip of the crocord process, which extends in toward the uh, glenohumeral joint space and can produce imaging, uh, I mean, can produce uh, impingement anteriorly. Uh, <clears throat> the concept here is that the, the normal crocord process, it should be relatively uh, superior in location, either at the level of the superior glenoid or above it. When it's below that, and especially when it's prominent, you, you can get this, uh, uh, you, uh, you can have increased risk for impingement in, the, in this particular location. And this one author likes to kind of uh, draw uh, the, this particular diagram. And when this angle uh, becomes much greater than 180 degrees or less than 180 degrees, uh, then you're at increased risk for primary core cord impingement. Uh, so, and that's called the chevron sign. So here we can see this is kind of a normal triangle here between the core cord process, the AC joint, and the top of the uh, humeral head. Here we can see that it's more inferiorly positioned, and if you draw that, you, you get the chevron sign in this location. So you can look at this. This case, there's still plenty of space uh, anteriorly here. Uh, I like to look at the axial images as well, uh, like mostly at the axial images, and look at the space between here, here, this distance between the, uh, the shortest distance between the coracoid process and the humeral head uh, should be more than seven millimeters. Uh, and this would be abnormal. This would be more of a normal space here, which is far greater than seven millimeters. Uh, there are several ways that you can get narrowing here. Another way to get narrowing is you can have the the inferiorly positioned coracoid process with a positive chevron sign, but also if you get superior migration of the humeral head, uh, that can bring a larger part of the humeral head up to this area, and that can also predispose to anterior impingement. But the diagnosis is not made by X-ray by MR alone. Um, oh, my, one of my shoulders, the one I had operated on, actually had a three millimeter separation here, and, and I had no symptoms in that particular location. So, uh, 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 so th this is a study that we did looking at the effect of glenohumeral rotation on the ability to identify subcorcoid impingement using MRI. So we did different degrees of internal and external rotation of the humerus. Here we can see this is very internal rotation here, where the intertuberous groove is right next to the coracoid process. Here's a neutral rotation, external rotation. The intertuberous groove would be way out here. So we looked at neutral, internal, and external rotation. <clears throat> and, uh, and then we, we looked at the uh, uh, measuring those distances, and there is markedly less distance in patients who had internal rotation. So if you're going to use this measurement to help determine whether you have risk for anterior impingement, it's very important that you uh, properly position the shoulder. And most of the time, the shoulders are... I, we try to have the patients externally rotated, uh, but let me tell you, if you have shoulder pathology, the externally rotated position is very painful. So if you have a true, real pathology in the shoulder, you'll find that most of your patients are going to be more in internal rotation uh, because it's less painful. And then uh, here we just made uh, uh, other, other measurements. And uh, uh, here is, I think this might have been a study with me anyway, uh, where we did different degrees of rotation uh, one is left and one is right. I think this is my right, which was uh, symptomatic at that time. And different, this is external rotation, neutral and internal rotation. And we can see that uh, uh, there is a big change here on the right. And this is the side that had the rotator cuff tear. 
Uh, so remember, subcortical impingement uh, does occur and is important. And if you see extensive narrowing, especially if it's a neutral, externally rotated shoulder, uh, then then be concerned about it. But there is another finding uh, that I'm going to like to show now, which I think is the key finding to look for this uh, with with MR. Who's next? Uh, me. You. Okay. Okay, roulette rotator cuff tear. Looking at the, uh, well, this patient's internally rotated. Good. Um, this patient's internally rotated. Yeah. I, I'm, okay, that's the subscap. Okay. So that's a subscap partial tear here. Go up here. Yeah. We make this measurement that was about five millimeters, which is shorter than it should be, but that seven millimeters is primarily for a neutral positioned uh, uh, humeral head. And then here we can see there's a lot of biceps tendinosis, lantern biceps tendinosis in this patient. Mm -hmm. And if we go to the sagittal images, you can, you can see that there's narrowing now in this location. And this patient was thought to have a symptomatic coracoid impingement. But generally, what I like to look for that I think correlates with actual symptoms is looking for edema, and particularly edema here, uh, right where the coracoid would impact upon the lesser tuberosity, uh, uh, next to but not exactly at the insertion of the subscapularis tendon. Edema in this location, I think, uh, tends to correlate quite well with actual symptomatic uh, anterior impingement. So this is really what I like to look for in a, in a study before I actually narrowing of this distance as well as edema within the subchondral bone of the lesser tuberosity without a lot of disease of the subscapularis as, uh, makes me concerned and raise the question of possible anterior impingement. Here's another example where you can see degenerative disease and cystic change. And there, this patient also was an internal rotation. Uh, with a, in this case, you had a lot of uh, partial tearing of the subscapularis tendon. Another case of sub, subcoracoid impingement. Okay. Uh, so let's talk a little bit now about. Uh, an important form of impingement in the overhead throwing athletes. Uh, internal impingement, that's often associated with GERD or glenoid internal rotation deficit, uh, which we'll have to talk about. This is seen only in high performance uh, throwing athletes. It's due to really to the extreme forces on the humeral head in the late cock and early acceleration phase. Uh, <clears throat> And it causes a impaction injury to the posterior superior aspect of the humeral head against the glenoid, right where you typically get a hill sacs injury. It's also right where you get traction injuries from the infraspinatus insertion. You get impingement on the posterior rotator cuff, and therefore a lot of these patients will have partial tears of the rotator cuff posteriorly, which is different from the normal area where we see tears start, which is anterior. And then it's also associated with a posterior superior labral tear. So this really occurs in the, the key phase of the throwing, which is the late cocking phase. This is the, the Job uh, diagram of the mechanism, throwing mechanism. You know, you start out with the hands at the waist, then you have the wind up where the hands go over the head, uh, then you have they separate the hands, then you have the early cocking. The late cocking, and this is where you have uh, forceful external rotation, and this is the stage where the internal impingement occurs. Then you have the acceleration, where you put uh, forward motion on the ball, uh, the release, and then the follow through and the finish. So now let me see. So, so this was a baseball game by the Angels back when they had a real baseball team. I'm uh, playing the the uh, Red Sox, and uh, this was a time when we were 
way ahead of the Red Sox in, in the playoff, but they, they actually beat us. This was a year or two after the Angels won the World Series. But let me go back here and let's go through this kind of slowly. So there the hands are together. So we're going through the different phases of throwing, the separation, then there's the early cocking, and then there's the late cocking. Now, I want all of you to try to get your arm in that position. Okay. See how far back his hand goes? Yeah. If, if you want to be a professional athlete, you, a thrower, you have to be able to get in that position uh, because if in our position, I can get my hand basically up to here. You release right there. So when I throw it, I have about 20 degrees of where I can put momentum on the ball. So my fastball is about 20 miles per hour. He's back here where there's probably closer to 80 degrees or 70 to 80 degrees of, of full rotation. So he can put momentum on that ball all the way through to the release point up here. And his fastball speed was 98 miles an hour. But to get in this position, you have to start throwing in your early teens. That's why all the Major League Baseball players basically started pitching in their early teens. Because what happens, and he can't do this with his left hand. He can only do it with his right hand. And that's because if you do a lot of pitching in your early teens, the bones actually remodel to allow you to be able to get in this position uh, <clears throat> Uh, by doing the throwing mechanism over and over again. And so that's what you have to, to get into. And then uh, uh, so we take this, then he goes through, there's the release. Now, if you go through all this, the release, these were each frame of the, of the video, and he went from the full cocking phase to the release phase uh, uh, within only one frame. And, and that's the acceleration phase, and that's where he really put it, where you put a lot of, uh, of the momentum to the ball. And then you go down the follow through all the way around. So that's the, the throwing mechanism. So one of the problems they have, John, is an inter internal rotation of the shoulder. Yeah, I'm getting to that here now, John. Good. Okay. Exactly. Sorry. That's the GERD. That's the GERD part, which John is referring to. So, so why you'll see if you take, uh, High level uh, pitchers, college level or pro level, as so what you'll find is that this arc of rotation shifts and it shifts so that they can go more posteriorly so they have more arcs in order to put momentum on the ball, but then they finish uh, uh, <clears throat> higher up than you and I would. So, what typically happens is the overall arc stays the same, it just shifts posteriorly in their throwing arm, but not their other arm. And this, the fact that they can't get their arm all the way down in front is called glenoid internal rotation deficit. And it was thought to be uh, part of the cause of shoulder pain in throwing athletes. Now it's more recognized that, uh, that the whole total arc changes. This is physiologic to the throwing mechanism. Uh, it, the, the total arc stays the same, but it just shifts uh, backwards. And that the uh, glenoid internal rotation deficit is more an indication that this patient is, this arm is changed physiologically due to the years of throwing. And what happens is you actually get the humerus uh, actually twists, which allows you to get in this rotation uh, uh, on the side where you throw, but it doesn't on the opposite side. So the bone actually remodels with repetitive throwing in the early teenage years. And this just uh, kind of shows, uh, this is the uh, dominant arm, this is the regular arm, and uh, uh, this is the different ages uh, of these individuals, uh, <clears throat> showing that in the non-dominant arm, you get less and less internal rot uh, glenoid internal rotation uh, as, as the shift occurs. And it doesn't happen in the in the non-dominant arm, but it does in the dom dominant arm. Or the, the, what's happening in the non-dominant arm is physiologic, which occurs to everyone. 
uh, but it's it's very different in the throwing arm. So historically, it was thought that <clears throat> these positional changes could be a cause of the patient's symptoms. Uh, Job thought that uh, that there was soft tissue scarring, which led to lack of internal d deficiency. So he used to do a lot of stretching exercises to try to get their internal uh, glenoid internal rotation deficit down. That's before they realized that it was actually a change in the shape of the humerus, the rotation in the humerus. Uh, Morgan on the East Coast, these were kind of two warring orthopedic surgeon who uh, uh, was a baseball orthopedic surgeon in Boston, uh, thought the primary problem was posterior capsular thickening. Uh, and and uh, I'm sorry. And he thought there was stretching to stretch that out. Uh, Job thought that uh, uh, you often needed a, an internal release, a surgical release. So this is just kind of a, a diagram it needs show, showing that the actual humerus changes from one side to the other. And this just shows the shift in the and the, the rotation. And this is just uh, here showing the difference in position players. There's really no difference in inter internal rotation de deficit. In pitchers, if you go from the dominant to the non-dominant arm, there's a big difference. So the non-dominant arm in pitchers is the same as everybody else. The pitching arm, we can see, is very, uh, very different with marked ro uh, rotation, internal rotation deficit not able to get all the way down to here. And now it's believed that there's really no evidence of contracture in the uh, these people and that the the retroversion uh, and the glenoid internal rotation deficit is really due uh, primarily to the, the remodeling of the bones at this particular, uh, in this time, which allows uh, you to, uh, since you, you have a rotation a torque around the axis of the humerus. It allows the uh, elbow the, to, to twist, and uh, you can get your hand farther back here, but that's still rigid, so it means that you can't go as far forward. So that, that's the, the general feeling about internal uh, uh, this problem. So uh, the pain uh, in these shoulder patients is generally due to the fact that they just overuse the shoulder, and uh, damage the soft tissues of, of the shoulder. Uh, and uh, and then this just shows, the, again, the difference in rotation deficit. And it was uh, a number of years ago, back around 2000, in fact, it may say here what year this is. I guess it doesn't. Yeah, 2007. Uh, uh, I was up in San Francisco lecturing at uh, David Stoller's course, and I looked at the paper in the morning before I was giving a, going to give a lecture, and this was in the paper from Bruce Jen Jenkins, in the set, who is a San Francisco uh, writer. I uh, said, sadly, the art of complete games have been lost, and this just shows in Major League Baseball, there was a peak in 1971 where uh, there was a large number of games where a single pitcher pitched the entire game, uh, but then it markedly decreased. As you can see here, and he thought that this was a travesty, that pitchers should pitch the whole game. But if you had the complement to this, which is uh, uh, how long Major League pitchers, pitchers were able to stay in the game, that would go like this. It would go the opposite. It's what people started realizing with this kind of research on the, on the shoulder from Morgan and, and uh, Job was that the more... The, they, when they started counting pitches, those pitchers who had the most pitches had the shortest lifetimes in baseball. And these guys started to be also, if you looked at the money that the pitchers made, it goes like this also. So they were becoming very expensive for the teams. Uh, so when they realized that the cause of shortening lifespan for the pitchers was due to too many pitches, they started instituting pitch counts. And the uh, number of complete games really started coming down, and it saved a lot of pitchers' careers. So now what happens with this is a thing called posterior impingement, 
which is fraying of the undersurface of the posterior supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendons, cystic changes in the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity, and a posterior superior labral injury. So this is a uh, MR arthrogram in the uh, Aber position. This is close to the position that you're in in the late cocking phase of throwing the ball. And here you can see this is where the posterior super aspect of the humeral head impacts upon the posterior superior glenoid. That produces this impaction injury here, which is in a very similar location, as I said before, to a Hill Sachs lesion. You get fraying in this particular case of the of the uh, of the uh, uh, posterior supraspinatus anterior infraspinatus tendons. That's a frayed cuff. In this particular case, there's a loose body, which is not common in this. But this was a major league baseball pitcher who did an arthrogram, and it shows uh, this is the the injury that you. You cock back and you impact the insertion of the supraspinatus tendon and the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity against the posterior superior glenoid. The impact against the posterior superior glenoid produces the labral tear, and this impaction produces these uh, typical bone injuries and rotator cuff injuries. So who's next? Okay, 14-year-old baseball catcher. Now, the second most common people to get this are catchers, but they're far below pitchers, but they practice the throw to second base. Uh, so it's two months, history of shoulder pain. Uh, looks like there may be some tendinosis of the infraspinatus kind of on the left image in there. And over here. Uh, and then yeah, remember, that... they shouldn't have a separation at the base of the posterior superior uh, <laughs> Labrum. This is a, a small tear of the posterior superior labrum. So we see the tendon. This is also a little bit of impaction injury here on the greater tuberosity. So this is kind of an early uh, findings that you can see uh, basically in uh, uh, little league. And here we can see some tendinosis developing in this posterior supraspinatus tendon uh, at an early age. And these are the kinds of findings that you see in early. Uh, uh, posterior impingement uh, due to overuse throwing. Uh, next. Let's see, let me just do this one. And this is another teenage baseball pitcher showing uh, a lesion here. It could be traction injury at the infraspinatus insertion, uh, but at this age and these particular people, this is almost certainly due to internal impingement. And you can see that there's a posterior superior labral tear in this uh, teenage picture, uh, all due to uh, posterior impingement. And here you can see the rest of that labral tear. So that's posterior impingement. Here's a little bit older individual. Here we can see the little impaction injury there, uh, some degenerative change, uh, abnormal signal intensity within the posterior uh, labrum, this little superior labral uh, degenerative type tear there. And this is another pace patient with internal impingement. John, were you saying something? No. Okay. I'm just uh, listening. Okay. And then I'm just showing progressive disease here. Uh, and then here we can see some uh, corticocystic changes uh, in this particular area. Uh, the labrum in this case looks pretty good, maybe a little bit of degenerative change. Uh, and a little bit of thickening, maybe a little bit of irregularity to the posterior superior labrum there. And uh, uh, this was uh, another Major League Baseball pitcher. More severe disease in uh, another Major League Baseball pitcher. Here we can see this repetitive impaction injury. In this case, we see a pretty significant supraspinatus tear here. This is probably due to overuse on the tendon and stretching of the tendon rather than. Uh, just the uh, posterior impingement process or internal impingement process. But here we can see uh, cuff injury, uh, the bone injury there on this particular patient. More severe disease. Here we can see a prominent cystic changes here. Posterior superior labral tear with a large pure labral cyst, which is going into the, uh, uh, the, the notch there uh, in this particular case. And there we can see the cyst extends into the notch here. And then you have to look for denervation changes within the muscles in this location. 
into spinal glenoid knots, and you can get uh, uh, denervation changes involving the infraspinatus muscle here. If it goes in the supraspinatus knot, you can get denervation changes of both the uh, infraspinatus and supraspinatus tendons. This is due to the posterior superior uh, labral tear, and there you can see the changes of denervation due to compression of the nerve and due to the paralabral cysts. Okay. Um. <coughs> Let's see here, let me think, Craig. So we have coronal views here. Looks like there's quite a bit of uh, cystic change associated with uh, the superior or adjacent to the superior labrum. Here are the axial images. So again, the posterior labrum, you see the cystic change. Um, yeah, so it's like maybe so labral tear and paralabral cyst formation. Um, and then there's fatty atrophy of the... Well, this is a PD facet image. Oh, PD facet. So okay. this is actually edema within the infraspinatus muscle due to a compression of the nerve that goes to it. So it's a denervation due to the paralabral cyst. And here we, can, here we can see the cyst in here. Into there, and you can see this is a T2 weighted image, so it's not as sensitive as the PD fat set, but you can see the difference in signal intensity between the infraspinatus muscle, which is innervated by the suprascapular nerve, and the uh, the teres minor muscle, which is innervated by the uh, axillary nerve. Okay, uh, Tayson, what do you think of this one? This is a little bit older individual who is also a baseball pitcher. Okay. Uh, I see a scallop margin that posterior glenoid. Good. Right? Here are the coronal images, where again you can see these subconocystic changes. And uh, this is something we typically see in around 20 year old age group. And this is due to chronic repetitive impaction uh, through the throwing mechanism involving the. Uh, subchondral bone in this location, which is a little bit different than the uh, internal impingement. This was actually uh, a uh, all-star pitcher for the Angels a number of years ago. Mm. Yeah, so here, posterior humeral head, we're seeing um, some cystic change there in the bone maybe from probably from impaction with the uh, with okay. the glenoid um yeah yeah labrum yeah. don't see a posterior labrum yeah it's knocked off very abnormal signal intensity with the labrum so this was on 10 8 2007 uh here's 7 2 2008 where some of that edema in the bone has gotten better, but we still have this big displaced posterior superior labral tear or posterior labral tear. Uh, 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 and here we can see marked atrophy of the infraspinatus muscle. And it's amazing, this guy was a Major League Baseball all-star pitcher, and one of his muscles was completely atrophied here, but the others more than made up for it in this particular picture. And this is probably because he he had chronic denervation that was never diagnosed, which which led to this from this process. One thing to remember in baseball pictures is that uh, uh, there are two muscles that are associated with the speed of the fastball. It's the strength of the pectoralis and the uh, and the uh, okay. What am I blocking on it? Muscle that goes from the the humeral stand to insert on the rib cage posteriorly. Um, uh, Pec minor? Latissimus dorsi. Thank um, you. Latissimus dorsi. Those, 
uh, latissimus dorsi and the pec major, those two muscles, the strength of those two muscles correlate very well with the fastball speed. So those are muscles that are worked on a lot by uh, pitchers. And with that, they do a lot of bench pressing. And if you don't bench press properly, as we've talked about, well, I don't know if we talked about it before or not. Uh, if you cock your arms too far back and try to bounce your shoulder off to get to be able to lift more weight, uh, you, you can pinch the posterior labrum and it's a common cause of posterior labral tears. So that's the other thing you need to look for in this group of individuals. This patient had surgery in the off season, uh, started pitching again during uh, preseason, uh, was transferred to another team, and uh, but he was uh, unable to continue, came back in, in July, and you can see he completely tore, he had a repair of the posterior labral tear, and uh, it completely tore again. Here you can see the suture anchors, and here's the tear of the construct. Okay. Any questions? All right, so we will go on to uh, rotator cuff disease uh, next week. Okay, thank you. See you on Monday. Thanks. Thanks, John. Have a good weekend. Great. That, that guy hasn't shown up yet. Oh, okay, John. Have a good weekend. Take care.